Okay, it is officially two o'clock, so we're going to get started. Today, Stuart and I are going to be talking about Beyond Out of the Box, Digital Climbers at Muncie Public Library. My name is Rebecca Parker, and I'm the Technology Coordinator for Muncie Public Library, and I manage the Connection Corner Library branch here in Whiteley. And my name is Stuart Cotton. I am the Creative Digital Mentor here at Muncie Public Library, where I help people with various technology needs and speed needs, apparently, nowadays. <laughs> so Connection Corner is a teeny tiny library branch that is in the Whiteley neighborhood of Muncie, which is a low-income neighborhood. It was previously the Conley Library, a full circulating branch, and reopened as a digital library branch in 2012. So this picture, I don't know if it quite does it justice, but our library is teeny, teeny, tiny. It is two rooms, essentially. And in this space, we serve adults and children in the same mixed-use space. We respond to people's technology needs, and we really try to bridge that digital divide and make sure that people of all income levels have access to technology and are able to use it creatively. Stuart and I teach a number of computer classes. We do one-on-ones. We do after-school programming for children, and we do uh, tech help that is both beginner and advanced. And these are just a few pictures of the space. We have iMac computers equipped with the Adobe Creative Suite. We have just standard uh, desktop computers. We have laptops. We have a drone. We have a 3D printer. Uh, so we also even have a little recording studio and green screen wall. There's lots of great resources here. Today we're going to be talking about Digital Climbers and how that program came to be. And first I want to talk about the problems that led to us creating the program. So at Connection Corner in 2015 when I started, the core child audience was unaccompanied kids ages 8 to 12 who arrived at our door immediately after school let out. They had spent the entire day at school listening to their teachers, being told what to do, and they were kind of done with that. They were ready to have some fun and to make some choices of their own. So we tried a lot of different things in searching for a solution that would work with this group of kids. Traditional programming didn't really work. We had a teeny tiny staff. Like I said, in 2015, it was literally just myself, Stuart, and Jim, our front desk person. So there were three people in the building that we're working with both adults and children at the same time, um, everybody in that same space, and sometimes it got a little rowdy. So we had a very small staffing pulled in a million different directions. Um, getting a group of kids all on the same page, paying attention at the same time, was really difficult because they didn't have any parents there to encourage them to actually participate and follow through. They could come and go as they pleased, and they had already spent that whole day at school. So they were kind of done listening. Plus, programming just cost time and money that we didn't have. So we really needed something that was an everyday solution so that we didn't have to keep coming up with and creating new things day after day. We found that working one-on-one -on -one with these kids really didn't work because there were too many kids and too few people on staff, and the kids just didn't finish what they started. And we found that letting kids freely initiate their own projects didn't work either because, again, small staff, uh, the kids wouldn't follow through with the projects, wouldn't put them away, and they didn't even know what was available to begin with or what was possible, so they didn't know how to initiate a project. So we tried to think out of the box. And part of this stemmed from we had a, a group from Ball State come in, and they had what was called the IT workshop out of a box. And so Drew, the, uh, the former Rebecca, <laughs> if you will, the supervisor here, Loved that idea so much. She thought, oh, it's just in the box, and you're going to just take it out of a box and hand it to a kid and get them going. So he thought, well, how can we get all of our offerings here in a box where a kid can just take it out and go with it? So we started to think about, along those lines, what would actually work. We wanted something that was really independent, where the kids could make choices of their own, the kids had spent a whole day at work, so we wanted to, or the whole day at school, so we wanted, wanted to incentivize them making the choice to continue learning. And for me, the most important thing was that we wanted something reusable and sustainable because I think all of us have had the experience of collecting dozens and dozens of toilet paper rolls for a project over and over again. 
and having people afraid to have ball jars around you because you were going to ask for them. Uh, so we wanted something where we weren't constantly trying to find supplies. And we wanted something that was measurable because, uh, well, we're techie people, so <laughs> data is important to us. <laughs> and we had to be able to attain it with a small staff and keep our sanity. So that brings us to the out-of-the-box challenges. So what we did was we came up with a, a list of step-by-step -step instructions for kids, such as stop motion or how to use the green screen, 10 different projects that they could just flip through a book. Let's see if that's the next one. Here's, a, here's an example of it. And at first, it wasn't very appealing because, A, a lot of kids don't want to flip through a picture or a pictureless book with just straight, sterile instructions. Um, so all of these projects are sustainable and repeatable. Oh, we've already done that. I'm sorry. Let me go the other way. So what we did was we developed it into this book right here. And as you can see, a lot of the instructions are a little more hands-on. They're a little more inviting for kids because there's pictures that complement the, the text. Wherever there was a, a button that they had to push, I tried really hard to get a picture of that button so that they could look through the screen and see exactly what it is that we needed to get them to do. Stuart, I'm going to pause for just a second. Absolutely. Um, apparently, some people are having trouble with the audio, so I'm going to wait until we've got that sorted out. Um, is anybody seeing me cut out right now, or is it coming through clearly? All right, so it's just a few people that are experiencing that issue. Okay, we can go ahead and continue. Oh, I am coming in now. All right, let's try getting a little closer to the microphone. Is that going to help? How's the audio now? All right, I'm going to keep talking for a second. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. <laughs> Once upon a midnight dreary. All right, so it's just a delay. We're going to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let the ISL staff keep working on this. I'm going to kind of pause the presentation, just keep talking for a minute until this gets sorted out. Um, I can re re recite quite a bit of The Raven if you guys are interested. Um, also can do Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, um, <laughs> four score and seven years ago. We're taking requests. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volumes I've forgotten lore, as I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to, are we okay to keep going? All right, good. All right, so Stuart, can you tell us a little bit more about the birth of digital climbers? So as it began, we started out with 10 challenges, 10 things that we could just get a kid going, and hopefully they could follow these step-by-step -step instructions and independently come up with the either the solution to the puzzle or if they're creating a picture, you know, to get a good quality picture out of them. And as time has gone on, we've added over 30 challenges, and we add some and we take some away. We're up to about 40 right now. Uh, total, we've probably gone through about 60 or 70 of them, but for various reasons, whether the kids could cheat at whatever the puzzle there was, if I walked out of the room, uh, we wouldn't give them. We took those out. Uh, if things would break constantly, if uh, challenges were made of paper. Yeah. And would... Or if they were really loud. Right. Like... We had one that was a marble run challenge, and we also had some Lego-based challenges. And we have a really small library, like I mentioned, and the sound echoes in here. So if you've had Legos before, you know that <laughs> sound of them like going through the giant tub of Legos. So we also took out challenges that just created behavior or sound problems <laughs> along the way. 
But essentially what we've gotten to is uh, all the benefits of those original out-of-the-box challenges, but they're a lot more user-friendly, they're a lot more attractive, and it's a full system. And it's a system that we've honed since November of 2015 when this program originally launched. So every loophole, I think if any of you are youth librarians, you know how amazing children are at finding every single loophole in the rules that could possibly exist. So over that period of time, we've been filling the loopholes, we've been creating more meaningful learning opportunities, we've been refining the challenges, and we've kept, uh, kept moving and kept changing in order to keep the program fresh over time. So as a creative digital mentor, my favorite description of my job has been somebody came in and called me a plate spinner. Because like a plate spinner, a plate spinner will get a plate spinning, and it'll get five or six going, and just as one of them's wobbling, he has to get that one going before it falls over into the rest of them. So that's kind of my role here, where kids will come in across the street from, from the elementary that we happen to have across the street at 2.37 every day, and they walk up to me and they say, Mr. Stewart, what, what is there to do? And I say, well, what isn't there to do? And I walk around the room and I, based off of what kid is asking me that, I'll give them something that I feel, feel that they're either interested in or I feel like they could take the next step based off of what they've been showing me through their work before. Um, I really try to get them to work as independently as possible. So I get them started. I give them just the bare minimum of what it takes to get through this project. And I say, let's see if you can figure it out from there. And I encourage them to struggle because I find that when you have something go wrong, you automatic your attention goes right to what is right. So, um, right. So I allow them to struggle a little bit, and I I I laugh with them as they struggle. I don't laugh at them as they struggle, but I say, well, isn't that funny that that didn't work out quite right? Let's let's make this thing work. You're gonna get it. Everybody gets these things right. I don't let anybody fail. I don't let anybody fail. But I also try not to put my hands into their, I, I have a rule. Use your words, not your hands. I never grab a piece from a kid and show them how it's done. I always walk them through it. Um, even if, they, if they're getting it wrong, I'll describe why that's wrong so that they're learning, they're learning how to learn. Um, and I try to walk away as, as much as possible just because I've got 10 other kids that also need that much attention. So I can, I can only go in there and spin the plate and walk away and let that plate do its thing. And the benefit of that system is that the children really get to own every single win because they didn't have an adult sitting with them and telling them step by step what to do. They got to choose what they wanted or they got to ask for some help in choosing what they wanted, but really it's, it's an independent choice and then an independent win when they get that. And one of the really cool things about our program is that every single challenge has a clear win scenario. So we don't have challenges that are just, you know, hey, let's let's talk about circuits. We have a challenge where you are completing a circuit, and at the end, you either have it right or you have it wrong. And the idea of that is to create win scenarios for the kids along the way. A lot of the kids that are in this program, it is an incentivized learning program so that there are some options um, of them getting, you know, a piece of candy or time on the gaming computer as rewards for what they do. But what the kids don't realize and what we have realized over the years is that those incentives are just to get them in sometimes. And once they're in the program, those wins, that sense of, of success is what actually keeps them going. So we regularly have kids that have been digital climbers for over a year that completely forget about the points because that's no longer their motivation. And the points are based off of the difficulty of each challenge. So each point is roughly worth about 10 minutes worth of work. And as you can see in this stack of papers right there, those are our challenge slips. Uh, each rubber band represents a month. So this is about, we've got about twice as many as this now. And these are how many educational things we've gotten kids to voluntarily do. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm getting a message that we're cutting in and out again. <laughs> uh, is there anything that we can do on our end to fix that?
We're connected. Everything's connected. Yeah, we're hardwired in, so it's not wireless or anything. All right. Okay, we're going to keep going. I hope that you guys can hear us. I'm sorry if you can't. I swear, we're not cussing whenever it cuts out. That's, that's not what it <laughs> we're is. We're not bleeping ourselves, I promise. <laughs> All right, so as we move forward with digital climbers, we had to uh, create those challenges that we talked about. We had to create artwork and theming that would tie it all together and make it a coherent system. We had to create the rules, which was an ever-changing, ever-moving target, because as we said, kids are magical, and they can find every single loophole that exists or ever did exist, or they can create loopholes out of nothing. Um, so you have to be really smart and always willing to adapt. And we had to create some really great data tracking so that we could prove that this program was actually useful. So in our data tracking, not only do we track how many points kids get, how much work they do each day, we also track each individual child, each challenge that that child has created, whether those challenges are moving them towards a, a learning goal, which are our level barriers. And we make sure that we track the sub-challenges within a challenge so that they're not repeating themselves. And if that sounds like a lot, it is, but it's also incredibly useful because we're making sure that the kids are actually challenging themselves and moving forward in their learning track instead of just repeating the same thing over and over again to get a piece of candy. As if they could, they would. <laughs> um, and then we've also done a lot of staff instruction. Because this program has been so successful, we were actually able to grow our staff at our tiny little library. And we now have another, another part-time staff person that's been incredibly helpful. And we have more volunteers because the community is really responding positively to this program. And they're excited volunteers that repeatedly come back. <laughs> um, so this is the first page of our Climber Challenge book. And I'm going to leave it on here for just a minute so you can really take a look. But essentially, the beginner level, you have to have at least 10 points, but you also have to have done at least two of those barrier challenges. And the idea behind barrier challenges is that we want kids who get to the expert level to actually be experts at something. And our kids, most of whom are between the ages of 8 to 12, um, we have kids every week that are learning basic Photoshop, that are learning how to do Final Cut Pro, that are learning how to do 3D design or an hour of code. And the best part is no one's forcing them to do that. They are making those choices. And so the level barriers really help us to ensure that a kid who gets to the top of the mountain with an expert badge is actually someone who can be an expert. And those kids take it very seriously and help each other and teach each other. And that's been a really great resource for us as well, is that kids actually become mentors to each other in this program. And it helps keep kids from pigeonholing themselves into one specific kind of challenge. It helps them to di diversify themselves. So as you climb the mountain, not only do you need the points, you need these challenges. So if you, if you don't focus on the challenges, sure, you climb with your, your beginner badge up the mountain. But the people below you can brag that you're not as expertise as them because they've got the intermediate badge, even though they haven't earned it, maybe as many points as that person. Mm -hmm. And this is just some of the more some of the different artwork that we have that goes with the program. Uh, we've got our beginner badge, our intermediate badge, our advanced badge, and our expert badge. And that mountain is printed out giant on our wall. And we've got these little magnetic badges that kids can move themselves up the mountain with. And that's been a really great interactive tool for this, is that the kids are physically moving themselves up the mountain as they complete challenges. And they like to see, oh, I'm beating Dimage this week, or oh, Calvion is behind me now. Um, so that's been really fun. All right, so when we look at the program as a whole and evaluate its success, I can tell you some anecdotal information, and then I can give you a little bit of data because, you know, we're techie people, so we've got both. Um, so we have a significantly larger children's audience at the library and higher program numbers overall. Um, our kids are really here with a purpose after school. And their parents are happy for them to come and hang out at the library because they know that it's not just hanging out. It's a purposeful time spent in the library. And there is never a single day at the library where there's nothing to do. Um, the kids have incentives to keep learning, keep exploring, keep trying new things. We try to keep the pro program fresh and add new challenges so that they never know what's coming next. Uh, and 
we generally just have a better relationship with those kids. I'm not saying that we don't ever have behavior problems, uh, but I think that they've gone down significantly and it mm-hmm. just feel better. Uh, we, we have a better relationship overall with those kids because they have a purpose, they know what they're here for, and they know what the expectations are of them. So that's been a really rewarding experience as well. And part of their having something to do, and they know when they come to the library, you're going to do something. A lot of them have started just doing their homework, which <laughs> was, wasn't a thing before. You know, they'd come out, out of school and just say, I just don't want to think about school anymore. But as we got their minds focused on challenges and completing things, I feel like that's the thing that they want to complete. There's one of the things they want to complete is their homework. For tell, them. tell them about the non-existent rule that they made up. So one day, a couple of weeks ago, one of the kids is saying, well, you can't do points. You didn't finish your homework yet. And I, that's never been a rule. <laughs> that's not have, a rule at all. I have never said that to anybody. I always say my one of my favorite phrases here is that's your freedom mm-hmm. is you're free to do any of these things or not. You know, that's not my job to make you do anything. Mm -hmm. But my job is to offer you all of these things, and they take advantage of it. You know, that's great. But I'm not going to correct those kids who think that they have to do their homework before they start Digital Climber. I'm going to let that fake rule exist until someone debunks it. Right. I won't (laughs) correct that. Right. Um, So these are just some images of the kids hard at work after school. Uh, This is them working on a Snap Circuits project. Here are kids posing with the mountain at our launch party and making funny faces with me. Um, And then here is Antonio working on a really fantastic Photoshop project. Uh, He was our first kid to get to the very top of the mountain, and he was really a great teacher and mentor for the other kids. He was so excited about Photoshop. He loved learning different things, and he actually got through every single Photoshop challenge that we had in the book, so I started having to make up challenges just for him, and that's what I love. I love seeing kids find something that they're passionate about and then challenging me to keep them interested. So this program has been targeted for funding and support by local organizations and grant makers. We've been really lucky to have been received well by the local community and gotten a lot of attention Um, for the program and people donating prizes, people donating equipment, people donating steam toys. Um, We've also been lucky enough to receive some national acclaim. Uh, The Digital Climbers program did win the 2017 ALA Library of the Future Award. So there's us at ALA uh, posing like big dorks because we are. (laughs) And this program is also being piloted currently by Carmel Clay Public Library and they are doing it under the title of Questers. And I'm really, really excited about all the wonderful things that they're doing with the program. It's really customizable, and it's something that they have tailored to their specific audience. So right now, we we have had, within the last year and a half, 195 climbers gain over 8,000 points total. This year alone has been 2,197 points. So that's actually, if you think about the point makeup, if one point is about 10 minutes of work, that means that in this year alone, there have been 366 hours of climber work. And that's just at at our tiny library branch. Right. And we have an average of 20 to 40 climbers each month. That is the capacity for the building or for the room that we do digital climbers in. You can only have 40 people in here. Uh, Scattered throughout the month, it works out just perfect. yeah, and then on our south side branch, we've had over 256 kids to climb in the mountain. Mm-hmm. And they've earned 2,100 points thus far in 2017. Uh, it may be expanded to a third branch in the coming year, and we are really excited to see it continue growing. Uh, we are interested in signing up um, up to five pilot libraries to test this program free of charge and to report on some potential issues and improvements. It's our hope that we will eventually be able to launch this program as a nationwide option for libraries. And I'm especially interested in making it available to tiny libraries like ours because it has absolutely been a lifesaver for us. Uh, When you have a really small staff and you have a group of kids that, you know, maybe don't have their parents with them all the time, having a program like this makes it possible to give them really engaging content 
over a long period of time without pulling your hair out or breaking your budget or making your staff quit because they're so tired. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really, really helped us immensely. And we have a task force that we've created for next year that is going to try to make that the changes to the program that are needed to make it available on a national scale. And that includes creating some new artwork and theme choices because I don't know if you guys know this, but kids aren't that into mountain climbing anymore. <laughs> so we're going to come up with some additional themes, make it a little bit cooler. <laughs> so now is the part where we would love to answer some questions from you. Um, normally, when we do this presentation, we get out our steam toys and everybody plays. And that's our favorite part. And so I'm sorry we can't do that right now. But if you have questions, we would love to answer them. The ages that we're targeting are ages 8 to 12. Uh, we hope in the future to expand the program and offer an option that is targeted towards teenagers. And we have some really cool, we have some really cool um, programs for teens that we might expand. Uh, over the last summer, we did a summer film school that Stuart and uh, Dan Allen, our digital mentor at the Southside Library, led together. And that was a really great experience, and I could see turning that into, you know, something a little bit closer to digital climbers or taking some of the elements from that and turning that into an older version of digital climbers. Um, yes, we do have a list of the types of kits and the number that we have for each of the students. Um, I won't go into super detail because I don't know that everybody wants that much detail right now, um, but some of our more popular toys are the Osmos. We have uh, Snap Circuit Arcade, Gravity Maze, Hex Hive. We have lots of different Goldie Blocks kits. So there are a variety of different toys we have. We also use a number of apps and websites and you know, programs from the Adobe Creative Suite. And the thing that we like about this program uh, is that you do not have to have one toy per child or one Osmo per child. Um, one of the things that we've seen at other makerspaces is that they will buy 30 of something or 50 of something thinking that they need to have something for every single kid so they can do a program all at the same time. And then that 30 Osmos or that 30, you know, uh, Ozobots, they end up spending most of their time on a shelf because you can't possibly have 30 out all at the same time. And so with this, we are able to have just one or two of each toy. And so it's really cost effective and everything's being used, but it's not, you know, extraneous. Mm -hmm. So that's been really helpful. Um, the question from Sarah is, what are the Osmo kits that you feel are a must-have? Uh, we have just about everything. We are going to be getting in the mail one more kit coming soon. But we've got coding, we've got numbers, we've got Tangram, we've got words, and we've got pizza. And I would say that our top three favorite are pizza, coding, and numbers. And numbers especially I think is a really great tool for outreaches because it's so quick and easy to explain to people, and it draws kids of different ages in. Uh, so I really recommend that. Whenever we go on outreaches, our, um, and we're kind of trying to explain digital climbers to people, the toys that are our go-tos and that are really quick and easy to explain are uh, the Osmo Coding, Osmo Numbers, Hex Hive, and Gravity Maze. Those are our top four, and we've just sort of set up a table with all of those toys, and it's been really positive and engaging and we love trying to get the adults to, to do the challenges with the kids or against the kids because that's really fun as well. And Marja asked a question about whether we have kits with 3D pens. And if so, which one do we find work well, works well? We have a 3D pen, but we really don't love it. Uh, and it's not part of our program because, I mean, it's, it's a neat craft toy. And I could see using it as a reward. But one of the things we really try to avoid is stuff that's going to be messy or stuff that we have to constantly buy supplies for, and that fits into that category. Um, so instead of doing the 3D pen, which we have the 3 doodler, um, we tend to try to move kids towards 3D design programs. Um, we have some apps that are useful, and we have some computer programs that are useful. We also use the 3D printer as a reward. So kids who earn five points can get a one-hour print. And kids who are in 10 points can get a two-hour print. 
And that's really great because they're learning and being rewarded at the same time. I'm going to give you that question. Is there a downside to having a MacBook Air? I would say there's not a downside to having a MacBook Air because that is a movable computer. That's a laptop computer that you can you can slap in front of anybody. Well, you wouldn't slap in front of anybody, but you know, <laughs> set it in front of anybody. Um, and usually, the cool thing about Macs is they come standard with iMovie and GarageBand, so you already have creative things that you can get kids doing with computers that the PCs just don't offer on with the ease that the, the Mac offers. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an audio expert to learn GarageBand, but like Pro Tools you would be. And one of my favorite aspects of the program is the, the Adobe aspect, because I was fortunate enough to go to a really great high school where I learned Adobe Photoshop and Final Cut Pro before I graduated. And those skills that I learned my junior and senior year of high school have helped me on every single job application and in every single job that I've had since then. And so if you can give kids that leg up, I think it's incredibly important. And our kids are learning that in elementary school. Um, so I really love the idea of these children going into high school already having those really marketable skills. Um, and I also think that it's just important in general for children who come from a low-income community to have access to creative technology. Because a lot of times when you don't own technology yourself and have limited exposure to that technology, you adopt a consumer mindset of it and you don't realize that you are an owner and creator because you aren't given those opportunities. And so we really want to give kids as many opportunities to create and feel ownership over the technology, feel that they are you know, able to meaningfully interact with the technology instead of being acted upon by it. Uh, so that's one thing that I really love. Um, Stuart, could you talk a little bit more about our Adobe challenges uh, and how you've had that work out for you? So we have challenges such as create a historical flyer where it's not just one thing that we're getting them to do. So they have to research about a person. They have to learn how to find quality, non-grainy pictures of this person. They have to write. They have to write a little bio about them, and then they have to get into the graphic design of it and arrange all these things and change the colors of it. And it's amazing. I, I've got, of all ages, people asking me about these things. And the kids that you would not expect to take up on these things, because you think, oh, they're too young for Photoshop, they're, they take off with it way better than some people that are in their 30s trying to learn it. Um, and it's really cool to see people, especially with the Photoshop challenges, anything that a kid knows and they know the answer to, they love blurting it out. Yeah. So when they see another kid struggling with Photoshop, they love to be the one that gets to go up to them and say, oh, no, let me show you how this is done. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of my favorite things about, I love to teach the Photoshop ones. Um, most of our challenges you can really do independently, and you don't need an adult to show you what to do. But the higher level challenges, you do kind of need to pull a digital mentor or myself aside and ask for some one-on-one -on -one instruction. And I love, love, love giving Photoshop instruction because the lesson that I do is very quick, very simple. And essentially, I have these kids choose their favorite celebrity, and then we do all sorts of funny things to their picture. So I teach them the clone stamp. I teach them how do you get rid of blemishes in a photo. I teach them the blur tool, and how do you make it look like people don't have pores when they do. And I teach them the liquify tool and show them how you could make you know someone's eyes a little bit bigger or someone's nose a little bit smaller. And in walking them through those experiences, we get to have a conversation about what is reality, you know, what... What, what you see in the magazines isn't real. And I think that's a really important lesson for boys and girls to have as they're going into their, their preteen years. And so my hope is that by giving them the power to make those changes to photographs, they're going to be able to look at photographs in a different way and understand what's real versus what's fake. Um, so I really love that aspect of the program. Um, now I'm getting some questions about our scheduling for digital climbers from Linda and Sarah. Uh, what I can tell you is that when we started, it was very unscheduled. We wanted digital climbers to be the thing that you did in the space. And so we didn't really have it during scheduled times. It was just something that we did every day after school. And over time, we decided to schedule it, one, so that we could count the program stats because our stats were going up really high. And if it's not on the calendar, you can't do that. <laughs> 
Um, and two, because we wanted to make it clear when we were doing digital climbers and when we weren't so that we could still occasionally do some fun one-off programs or do a reward day for the kids who have worked so hard during the week. So currently we do digital climbers from 2.30 to 4.30, Monday through Wednesday. And that's kind of loose. A lot of the times the kids will go until 5 or 5.15 because if they're in the middle of a project and working really hard, we want to let them continue. Um, and then our branch is open until 6 p.m. Which gives me 45 minutes or so to plug in all those numbers. Because at the end of the day, we I've got a stack of challenge slips that I just crunch into the computer. And it usually takes me about 15 minutes, but at the end of the day, people still have questions. So I still have to break away, and it takes me about a half hour. Uh, yeah, we can talk a little bit about peer mentorship and cooperative learning. Uh, so these are independent challenges. The kids work by themselves, and they own all of their wins. But I do see a lot of kids helping them, out, them each other out. And I also see a lot of kids just acquainting each other with the program. So one of the things that libraries who are interested in piloting the program always ask us is, how do you introduce this to kids? How do you have like a new kid come in on a Wednesday and you know, then you explain this giant complicated program with all these rules and all this, these data and all these options? I mean, it's a lot, right? And the answer is, we really don't very often. I throw them in the deep end, and they swim. And as they're swimming, or as they're working on their first project, they're looking at, around the room, and they're seeing the flow mm -hmm. on all levels. So they know that when they get it done, they're going to get a slip that they get points for. They know, eventually, that they can spend those points on something. I usually don't, because the game itself entices them to start. Mm -hmm. If they slip and they, they're starting to stop, then I'll start to mention the points and say, well, when you get this done, you'll get these points that you could spend on candy. But before that, I just say, let's get you finished with this, this project. And I fill out a slip, and they're like, well, what's this all about? Then I explain it to them. Mm -hmm. And the kids along the way explain it to each other, help each other, um, and also enforce the rules with each other. Right. Because they don't want to have to stop doing what they're doing. They're, they don't want to lose out on the ability to get candy that day or lose out on the ability to play video games that day. So they really keep each other in check and make sure to explain the way the program works to each other and also walk each other through the basics of challenges. Um, and Stuart is really great about explaining to the kids that we explain with our mouths and not with our hands. And so we have these kids learning how to teach and learning how to teach without showing and without doing. And so that's been a really great experience as well. And that applies to the parents as well. Yes, <laughs> that's the hardest one. We've done a couple. Usually we don't have a lot of parents in the room, um, but on occasion we'll have a parent come in with their kids to do digital climbers. And it's always a lot harder than when the kids are by themselves because we have to teach the parent what our teaching philosophy is. And we have to make sure the parents know that this is not a project you're doing with your children. This is a project your child is doing and that they are going to get to own. And so if you want to help them, do so from a step back, basically. And I think that works really well in our community. I don't know if it would work well everywhere, but I think it's really important because a lot of times, you know, kids don't feel like they get to own their wins. And so when they're here at our library, they always do. I mean, they physically have to sign their name on their win, on that challenge slip. I never put their name. I always have them put their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to answer your question, Sarah, one supervising adult for 20 kids, um, that would be a pretty busy day, but I think it's absolutely doable. What we have is um, a full-time person and a part-time person, and that's usually really good for 20 kids. Um, and the part-time person can kind of be in and out of the room a little bit. You don't have to be there 100% of the time, but he's there when it gets busy or when there's a lot of questions. Um, so that has been really helpful. I think it's doable with one supervising adult for 20 kids. We've definitely done it mm -hmm. before, and we'll do it again. But it's a long day, and you're going to sleep well that night. Right. And you will have a flurry, a moment of a flurry of questions where you hear Six people say your name all at once, and you've just got to explain, oh, not all at once, I'm going to start with you because you're standing closest to me, or you because, I don't know, whatever, you know, feel it <laughs> out. But, yeah, it gets a little chaotic, but it, that, that is manageable. Yes, it absolutely is. And we really kind of watch out for each other and try to come in whenever there's mm -hmm. a big flurry of activity. Um, but it is, it, it's really great because you are able to host a good big program with a large number of kids and just one or two adults. 
in the room. So that's something I really like about it. And you'll sleep well that night, but you're not going to be pulling your hair out. And overall, it's a really positive experience. Are there any other questions? Something I can mention is um, we keep a lot of the statistics available to the kids. Mm -hmm. So because I can't keep coming to my computer to look up somebody's points and how many they can spend and what they've done, I check mark. well, I, I post all the points where they have access to it. We just tape it to our, our digital climber store. And then I have a couple of binders with the, the actual projects in it that we check off to make sure that they're not repeating the, the same project over again, but they can find that information that they where they are. I don't have to constantly pull up my computer. And another risk of pulling up on my computer is then they have access to change it if I walk out of the room because somebody asked me a question as I was answering how many points do you have. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy has a question about whether we've had issues with equipment loss. I can tell you that has not been a big issue at this no. branch at all. And I, I think it's because they have constant access to it. Mm -hmm. We don't put anything away, really, that's out of sight. It's all on a shelf ready to go. If they know it's theirs to for whenever they want it. If they take it away, they risk losing all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little part of it. And another part of it, uh, I like to use the, the Mr. Rogers example. Mr. Rogers once had his car stolen in New York City. And it was in the newspaper, you know, it's like, oh, can you believe somebody would steal Mr. Rogers' car? The very next day, he had his car back with a note on the windshield that said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rogers, I didn't realize this was yours. And I think that's the kind of respect that we're wielding, because everybody knows that we're doing everything we can to make them better people, or just to make life as good as it can be for them. Yeah. And I, I think uh, one of our other branches did have a little bit of an issue with things walking away. And it was because I believe they had a new staffer in that program who hadn't quite developed a rapport with those students yet. It was still in the process of being developed. And as that rapport was developed, as rules and boundaries were made clear, I believe that that, that problem started to, to lessen significantly. So really, it's about the relationship with the kids, having an expectation of behavior, enforcing that expectation, and also creating a community in which the kids police themselves because they know they want to keep this going. Um, and so I've had, you know, I, I do occasionally remind kids, oh, you need to put that away properly. You need to pick that up off the floor. But just as often as I remind the kids, the kids remind each other. And so that's been a really wonderful experience um, is, is seeing the kids learn what the value of the program is, learn what the value of that space is, and work to keep it going. Um, one of my favorite stories that I like to tell about Digital Climbers is we had a week where a lot of kids were learning Photoshop. Like, it seems to come in waves. Like, you'll have two whole weeks where nobody wants to learn Photoshop, and then all of a sudden, all these kids want to learn it. And so we had all these new kids who had the basics of Photoshop's on, Photoshop under their belts, and they asked me, hey, could we do like an NBA 2K17 tournament? I want to do a game tournament in here. And I said, well, I think we could do that, but I would really need someone to design a flyer for that program. And I would really need someone to type up a rules list for that program. And so the kids got together and formed like a little council, and they came up with rules because I told them if they fought, that I would end it. So they came up with rules that would prevent them from fighting with each other, and then they designed a bunch of flyers for the program. And that's been a really great thing, is that they feel empowered in the space. They feel that they can create things for themselves mm -hmm. and for each other, and they know what sort of behavior is expected in order to get to keep it. And this program she's talking about was a, as a video game tournament for 2K17. So they'd come up with rules for themselves, like nobody can be the Denver Nuggets, because everybody wants to be the Denver Nuggets, it's just going to be an argument. Miss Rebecca said if there's an argument, it's done right away. <laughs> Yeah, they had all sorts of rules so that they could avoid the fighting. So um, Beth asked a question about the space during the time is staffed when open. So the entire building is the space, essentially. Um, we have a room where we do digital climbers, but that doesn't mean that the room is restricted to just digital climbers. We have adults in and out of the space because the back part of that room is our audio recording studio. 
So the entire building is open to the public. We have adults and children interacting in the same space because there's no designated youth services area. And that's also been a really rewarding aspect because we have adults inspired by the things that the kids are doing and kids inspired by the creative projects that adults are doing. So I have an adult come in because actually this is a very multi-purpose space. Not only is it my office, it's a classroom and it's also our studio A. So we've got a video, we got a green screen in here. And every once in a while, I'll have an older guy come in and, and want to do a music video. And normally, a lot of people would ask all the kids to leave. But a lot of times, a lot of these people will just say, no, kids, stay. Watch what we're doing. And they can get inspired to say, oh, well, look at this old guy doing this really cool thing that young people do that I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they can imagine how to do that because they see it in yeah. front of them. Yeah, on occasion... Uh, we've got a lot of rappers that use our studio to record music, and sometimes they'll be headed out of the studio, and they'll see the kids playing NBA 2K17 or Overcooked or something like that, and they'll be like, hey, man, can I hop on that video game with you? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's become a really great community of people, and it's people of all ages learning and creating, um, so that's been a really wonderful experience. Um, and Deborah, related to your question, our full-time responsibility is the space. Uh, as I mentioned, we do not have separate youth services and adult services folks. So Stuart Day he usually starts out by teaching an adult class for seniors. He does book a tech tutors, which are one-on-one -on -one appointments throughout the middle of the day. He tries to get a lunch at some point because he's <laughs> always being asked questions. And then the end of the day is spent doing digital climbers. And sometimes we'll even do a second adult program as a late evening program from, you know, 5 to 7 or 6 to 8, and we'll stay open late um, because we want to be responsive to the community as a whole. So we do a mixture of adult and kid stuff all day long. And even during Digital Climbers, adults are not afraid to come ask me questions. And if I'm working with adults, kids are not afraid to ask me questions. At no point is anybody ever afraid to come <laughs> and ask me a question. Stuart is the hardest working man in show business, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we have Aaron, who is our part-time person that helps out with Digital Climbers and also mans the desk for the last portion of the day. So he, he's working double duty. I'm working double duty because I'm managing the space and working in the space with people. And I also am on a bajillion committee, so I'm in and out. So nobody in this building just has one thing that they're ever doing at one time. We're all big multitaskers. Mm -hmm. And that's why this program works for us because it's a big multitasking program, right. essentially. But we wouldn't have it anywhere other way. No, we really, no, no. we're proud of what we've created. We love the program. We feel like it's completely doable for a small staff and a small library. And we love seeing kids making choices and challenging themselves and, you know, day after day choosing to do something educational. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a really great experience. We've seen that it does encourage good habits. Of They have a habit of they come in, they want to do something. Mm -hmm. It used to be, uh, you know, you try to get them to do something. They just, ah, no, I just want to sit here and look at YouTube or something like that. But now, I can't remember the last time somebody was watching YouTube in here. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I can't think of the last time that happened either. I mean, if I think back to when we first started and how... All of our desktop computers were filled with kids just playing Roblox or watching YouTube. And every time we would come up with this program that we thought they would enjoy that was even a little bit educational, we'd be lucky if we could peel one or two of those kids away to sit through the program. Um, and so that was really hard and disheartening for us. I think everybody who's a librarian has experienced that, where you put all this time and effort into something that you think is both fun and educational, and the kids hear educational, and they're like, nah, I'm good. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, the only thing we could get the kids to do is just straight up parties. Right. Um, and those take a lot of effort to, put, to throw. Yeah. So they're definitely not something that you can do every single day. Uh, and so having this as a staple, as something that we can do Monday through Wednesday, every week, um, it really, it allows us to feel that we're using our time effectively. It allows us to have really great relationships with the kids, and it just solves so many problems for us. And it helps with a diverse amount of characters coming in, because there doesn't matter what kind of person comes in here, we've got a challenge for you that you're just going to love. And we ran into it where we started. We tried to do 
All right, today we're going to do stop motion. Everybody's going to do stop motion because that's the thing to do today. And we'd get the one or two kids to, to come in, and a lot of them wouldn't even finish because they see all their other friends goofing off out in the, the lobby or whatever. And it just... Didn't feel like, great. Like, yeah, it didn't <laughs> feel great. So opening up just everything that we have to do and giving them the choice, all of them went their opposite directions, but they're all kind of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when you look around the room, you don't see everybody goofing off. You see everybody working on something. And well, when I see that, I want to do that, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's also social. So if you have kids all on the same page trying to get them to do something, you obviously are going to have to dissuade talking and chatting to some extent, at least while you get your instructions out. Uh, and for this, I mean, the kids are each working on things in their own time, in their own way, and they can chit chat while they do it. And they can, you know, help each other out and, and be social with each other. And so it's not something, it's independent, but it's not isolated. And it's not constrictive or restrictive in, in any way. So that's been really wonderful. So how do we house all the kids in an open way? It's literally just an open bookshelf. Um, the only thing that we lock up are the iPads. Um, the toys are all out and about. Um, so those are, are very out and accessible, and um, they are not extremely expensive toys. So we don't want things. Um, we don't want things that are going to be the end of the world if they walk away to be out and free. But if, you know, we have to replace a Snap Circuits kit someday, we can do that. If we have to replace a Goldie Blocks kit someday, we can do that. Um, but the, the high value technology is secured um, and the rest is really open and free for the kids to grab mm -hmm. and use as they need. Except for the prize closet. To make it seem a little more special, they, to even look at it, we got to unlock a cabinet and open it up and they think, oh, what's in here? What's in, <laughs> this is hidden, you know, this, but this is for me? I can afford these? You know, it's, yeah. it's fun. We, we lock the prize cabinet not because we're afraid of it walking away, but because it really does make it more special for the kids when they have to, like, pull an adult over and get them to unlock it. So that's really fun. All right. I'm really sorry that some of you are here, having trouble hearing the recording. I, I don't know how we could have fixed that. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed uh, this presentation. If there are any other questions, we would be happy to take them. Um, and if not, I really hope that the recording of this uh, works well. Um, if you have any questions for us, um, I will be putting my email in this chat, um, and I would love to talk to any of you. We've also arranged some uh, visits from other libraries. Um, so if you wanted to come and visit, try out the toys. Um, then we would we would be happy to have you come and visit us at the library and and check out our teeny tiny little space. And there's a video promoting digital climbers if you want to kind of see see a little bit of visual of it on YouTube. Yeah, I'll I'll find that link real quick and and put it in the chat. Okay, this is Kim. I just want to thank uh, Stuart and Rebecca for presenting today. Uh, they were both excellent presenters at our uh, Differences You conference this year, so we, we were just so excited to have them. I do apologize for any uh, sound issues uh, that, that we had today. We did test, and I don't know what happened, but as you know, things do happen, so that's technology for you. Um, I appreciate you all attending there. today. This I didn't allow. Yeah, as when we scheduled, I didn't realize it was the day, the, the Friday before the holiday and at 2 o'clock, so go figure. So thank you all for coming. Um, those of you who did attend today, you will be receiving one LEU today. You'll get your LEU certificate within 30 days. Um, you will also get a link uh, to the recording as well. And again, I believe... Um, Stuart and Rebecca, they've given you their contact information, and there's also the uh, link for the, uh, for the YouTube channel to see more about uh, digital climbers. So unless Stuart or Rebecca or anyone else has anything, I wish you all a happy Friday, and 